I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Julia Mossbridge. Julia has a PhD in Communication Sciences and Disorders from Northwestern University, an MA in Neuroscience from UC San Francisco, and a BA with Honors in Neuroscience from Oberlin College. For the past 15 years, she's been studying the psychology, physiology, and physics of precognition and time travel. As an internationally renowned expert on prediction, she's addressed audiences around the world in her work shaping the field of time travel. She's taught intensives on precognitive forecasting to executives at Google X and the Vail Symposium, invented and patented the Choice Compass app, and currently pursues her mental, informational time travel and precognition research as funded by the Robert Wood Johnson and Bial Foundations. She joins us today to once again discuss her research into cognitive neuroscience, predictive abilities, and the mysteries of the human mind. So Julia, welcome. Welcome back. Uh, Thanks. Always good to be here. Today's off the beaten path, right? So yeah, we'll just kind of roll with it, I guess. That's, you know, but this, for me, this starts, this starts with this idea, right? It's the idea that sticks in your head. And it's like, man, there's something there. And, and what this is, is we've all had these experiences that we can't explain, right? And, you know, we, uh, we call them different things. I mean, people call them clairvoyance. They call them telepathy. Um, you, you could call them synchronicities, deja vu, right? All of these things. And, and psychology has really well-defined rational explanations for why they happen, but that doesn't hold water for a lot of these, you know? I, I, would that be fair to say? Oh, of course. Of course, it's fair to say. I mean, so, um, yeah, I just want to back up and say, when you say psychology has explanations. So psychology includes actually the study of what we call anomalous phenomena like these. Um, and that, inc- or some people call them parapsychological phenomena or para- paranormal phenomena. I don't like those terms because they're right along with everything else. Um in psychology. People have had these for thousands of years. And so sorting out what's actually going on with them, uh, one explanation might be very mundane, like um, you're getting unconscious, uh, you're processing unconscious sounds that eventually give you the feeling it might rain. And then you say, I have this feeling it might rain, right? Because you're actually hearing rumbling in the distance and then it rains. So that's a very mundane explanation for this kind of thing. Yeah. You might feel like you're psychic, but you're just unconsciously processing a lot of information. And then sorting that out, sorting the difference between that out, um, between that and the actual uh, evidence that suggests that you can actually receive information when there is no sort of sensory subconscious or unconscious processing. um, And that you could actually, it's almost like you're receiving information from a non-local source. So by non-local, I mean distant in space and time not available to you through your five senses in the here and now. And sorting out this difference is really hot and important right now because there's a whole group of psychologists who don't believe that there's a difference. They believe everything is the subconscious mind processing information, but they can't explain some very clear results that have been obtained again and again and again, showing that you can receive information in this kind of other way. So... We're kind of at a crossroads right now around this this belief system in psychology, and it's I think starting to shift the more people talk about it. Yeah, well, it, it, as it should, right? I mean, I think that the traditional explanations work, and I think they work well for for most cases, right? And like um, again, I I spent several hours just kind of refreshing myself on this. I've read them all many many times, right? And this would be like the skeptical, or you could call it the debunking view, you know, but. And, and so, for instance, like uh, you you think about your mother several times a day, right? And then she calls and you think, oh, I was just thinking about her. Oh, you, th- that can't be a coincidence, you know? And so what it is, is your brain is really good at pattern matching. And basically it fits the data to fit the pattern, right? And that that yeah. does, that happens all the time, you know? Yes, we do, do it that. all the time. And, and that's part of how we survive. So there's... Um, I mean, the brain is a prediction machine. You know, Dean Bono Bono at UCLA, a neuroscientist that wrote a great book called um, Your Brain is a Time Machine, I think it's called that. And it's all about how um, your brain is designed to try to predict things and to draw these associations so that you can survive. If you're in the forest looking for berries, 
and you find a tree that has berries, then the next day you want to predict where the berries are going to be, you're probably going to go towards that tree, right? And so there's, it's about survival, but also about survival is if there is this, is this concept that I'm about to say, sorry about the backwards um, grammar, um, <laughs> but if, if there were a way to get information about events that aren't available to your memory, that aren't available to your unconscious processing of sensory information, but that still somehow exist in sort of the map of the universe over time, then we should be getting that information. So when you say something like um, those mundane explanations work for most cases, there's a whole group of people who would argue, including Jim Carpenter, who wrote the book First Sight, who would argue that actually we're always getting information from non-local sources and we don't usually notice it because it's yeah. just going through these channels. When we notice it is is when um, it really means something. Like we notice it, like, like uh, I'll just give an example because this kind of thing has like me, like many people has been happening my whole life. Um, I, I had this experience once driving home from work. Uh, there are two roads that are basically at a certain time of day, you never really know which one's gonna be the right one to take in terms of time. So it's kind of a crapshoot. So uh, I had this strong feeling on this particular day, it, almost in words, usually it's a knowing sense. This was in words that said, take this take this path take sheridan right which is the name of the road take sheridan okay okay don't take so the other path Ro robert there's robert frost thing right the yeah road yeah there are two roads right and so what did i do because i'm sort of i mean i do things like i write my own recipes and then i don't follow my own recipes like i'm sort of i'm sort of like into making original things every time that, um, that's okay i'm feeding my dog i told you this last night i'm feeding my dog tacos and she right. loves it right so exactly exactly so you know i'm sort of into like let's do something original so the thing says you know go on this road i decide well i'm going to see what happens if i go on the opposite road so okay. i go on the right because i'm not going to listen to myself and so <laughs> i go on the opposite road and um someone rear ends me and i was fine everything's fine that person was fine the car was dented but it, since then I, that was about 15 years ago. Since then, I've been like, okay, so if I get a feeling that I, that, you know, or even as a set of words that I'm to do something, like, I'm going to do the thing. So I made a commitment. I'm going to do the thing. And things have worked out a lot better since. Yeah. So, you know. Well, that's, see, and that's a subtle message. I miss the big ones, right? Like big sign that says road washed out, don't proceed, you know? And I'll just be like, hey, I think I'm getting a message here. I'll just keep going, you know? But <laughs> And it's like, and it's like already like presented to your sensory information right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know what? We have one of those where the dog, where I, where I, one of the places I walk the dogs and I actually kind of drive around the washed out section. I'm like, yeah, I can make it. I can. Yeah. <laughs> because uh -huh. <laughs> that'll work so right right because the rules don't apply to me yes yeah, that's yeah <laughs> yes that's right right and then i consistently it's like you know why did that happen so far i've been okay but you know lord only knows so right. um so i mean going back to going back to these events though I, I mean you know like i mentioned some of the stuff in psychology again these are these are kind of the dismissive classical mainstream approaches there's a very good reason that they came up with these right it's it, part of it is occam's razor it's like can we explain this without you know going deeper and it, part of it is you know psychology is a clinical practice right and if someone comes into your office and they're like i have all of these things happen you know it helps to be able to give them an explanation they can go home with and basically get on with their lives right instead of opening up a bunch of new doors sure so. and you can prove that that you can prove um that those explanations are correct in many cases I, but that doesn't mean that underlying those explanations isn't consistent uh non-local information reception it's yeah. just that those aren't it's not evident unless you do the experiment so you t so in order to really show that that stuff is going on you have to do an experiment where you're controlling and making sure that there isn't this kind of 
sensory leakage, this kind of information coming into the unconscious mind. And the best way to do that is to do an experiment where no one, including the experimenter, and, and, and including the software that's running the experiment on the computer, knows what the outcome is going to be, right? So that there's no sensory leakage, there's no information on which the unconscious processes can operate. And then you do that kind of experiment again and again and again, and you see if there's some kind of indicator that can predict this future event that's unknown to everyone. And that's how you show that it's going on. Well, and so one of the things that's really interesting, I used to listen to Dean Radin, Radin all the time on Coast to Coast AM, and he had talked about noetic society experiments where they basically they said that consistently human beings run above the statistical average for basically these predictive tests, right? And I, I believe those were the guess the cards, and I think the Princeton egg is is tied in with that. And then he he had some really interesting stuff that he talked about with September 11th as well. And it was the same thing where it's like, we appear to be getting this information from other sources and, and just to make life complicated, it gets mixed in with our subconscious, right? So it's not like a clean signal, but, you know, from, from what I understand, he was saying, you know, statistically we ride high on these tests and that's always going to be that way. Yeah. Because it's, um, because it, 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 uh, this is based on the data, even without selecting people with talent at this. So some people have talent at this, uh, just like musical talent. Some people have talent at this capacity to perceive future events or to get this non-local information, however you want to say it. Um, but even not selecting for that, just getting a swath of people in and testing them, on average, they're going to score above. That doesn't mean they'll always score above. And also the test really matters. So there are some people um, replicating some of Daryl Bem's tests that are very difficult to replicate. Probably they're very noisy. I've tried to replicate them, super noisy. Um, so I wouldn't say like you should just choose one test that has been difficult to replicate. And then if it doesn't replicate, then you say it doesn't exist. Like that's not good science. So choosing a test that actually does replicate and does have a, a larger effect size and then doing that again and again, that will convince you if you want to if you're a scientist and you want to be convinced that there's something going on or that there's not right so that should be the way that it's done and um, so the test that i think that is most replicable is surprisingly well actually there's two of them um, one is a physiological test so mm. the person the person it doesn't matter kind of what their opinion is um, about predicting the future or this kind of psychic stuff you can hook up physiological equipment to them and you can see that their body is actually predicting the, the stuff that's unknown. So that's one one thing that I'm, one sort of phenomenon that I've looked at that replicates. And then at the other end of the spectrum in terms of both the amount of time ahead know, uh, that you can know things as well as the level of consciousness, the other end of the spectrum is uh, precognitive remote viewing. So that's taking a modality called remote viewing, which was, um, the name was made up by the military, essentially, um, from the 70s to the mid 90s um, to create psychic spies. And so they made it all very technical. We're going to do remote viewing. Um, but it's basically a bunch of psychics, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then, so that's well, like. It, it wasn't just psychics. I, I, the men who stare at goats, right? And that movie was oh, hilarious. Yeah. But the first scene, the general tries to run through the wall and he just bounces off at me. He's lying on the ground. He's like, damn. Yeah, it was everyone trying everything, right? And so, um, it was that's... the '60s. That's the thing. It was the yeah. '60s. They just try. Yeah, they and the '70s, was... and and that's oh, just, that's, that's yeah, that is right. Yeah, yeah, and the '80s, and um, <laughs> and um, and with good reason, right? Because there is some evidence that the material, like the wall thing, right? There is some evidence from quantum mechanics that material stuff isn't as material as we think it's behaving in weird ways. And so that's counterintuitive. And so you could tell yourself a story about all that stuff. And so it's not so crazy. Um, but having said that, some people, and actually people on average, even the first time you talk to them about remote viewing, can uh, predict future events that are right above chance. And um, yeah. so, so I've been looking at those two ends of the continuum, mostly in my research. The remote viewing end, which is largely conscious, like I'm talking to you and I'm saying this is what I see or whatever, um, and can be a large amount of time ahead of time, days, weeks, months. 
sometimes years. Um, and then the other end, which is on the order of uh, 500 milliseconds to 10 seconds or 15 seconds ahead of time and is physiological and doesn't rely on conscious report. So these are sort of, I, I think it's interesting to look at the two extremes as two test cases and try to understand what that what those mean um, and what affects, what affects each of those kinds of tasks. And for both of them, you know, on average, you're seeing results above chance. And um, for both of them, it's really hard to convince other people that you're not either crazy or fraudulent. <laughs> And that's and that's really I'd love to talk about that because that's really a cultural um, issue people have. So I noticed that when when folks in string theory say, well, you know, there's like eleven dimensions, and then everything else is this one squiggly dimension, and da 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 da, people are like, oh, that's super interesting. Yeah, it well, it's framing context, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, it, you know, and it, I would say that, that scientific models obviously have limitations, right? I mean, they, they're models of science. And what do they say that the map is not the territory? And that is one of the reasons that they're struggling to unite quantum mechanics and relativity theory, because they are different models and they express concepts differently, right? And then it's like, okay, we need these to come together. How do we get them to come together? Now, in physics, that's just taken for granted, right? But in something like psychology or psychophysiology, right, then people are like, well, that's not possible, you know, so. Well, and it's because we, I mean, that's a, it's, those are harder fields because we think that we know what's going on with us. Whereas we know we don't know what's going on with physics, right? Like most people who are physicists are like, oh my God, physics, you know, have no idea. We don't have intuitions about it for the most part. But with psychology, you know, I think that I, I'm talking with you right now. And I, if someone were to tell me you're not actually talking to Tim right now, I'd be like, yeah, that's BS. I'm talking to Tim because I have this experience of talking to Tim. And so we trust our experience, even though much of it, can be shown to be illusion. Yeah. Well, and it's it's interesting. There's so many cultural factors too. And again, this is kind of off to the side, but when when I, I I'll just say a few years back, I went to a psychic and asked her for relationship advice, right? Oh, a few mistake. years back. We'll just put that out there. <laughs> you, you know what's interesting though is so it turns out um this I, I I found someone who was highly recommended. I thought, you know what? Let's try it. Let's give it a try. Ronald Reagan did psychics. If Reagan did it, I can do it. So so I went to the psychic and asked for relationship advice. It turns out that everything she predicted was completely wrong. I mean, it was just bad, right? But I realized after the fact, looking back at it, that she was an amazing therapist. And I was mm -hmm. like, wait a minute. I bet that is why it's part of our culture. They they basically just use this hocus pocus, uh, you, you know, I mean, they, they rub their crystal ball and say, okay, here's what we're going to see. But what they're really doing is just providing therapy. And, mm -hmm. you know, 500 years ago, people didn't know what therapy was. So I'm right. like, ah, I get it. It's fulfilling a cultural need there. And it, it really has little or nothing to do with the smoke and mirrors part of it. Well, and it depends on the person. And so on average, my experience with street psychics has been really poor <laughs> in terms of accuracy. And also, by the way, in terms of their therapeutic abilities, <laughs> but <laughs> you got a good one um, in terms of therapy. Um, but most of the people, I guess I would like to say most of the people that I've worked with who are really quite provably psychic are not interested in telling people what will happen because they realize it's not so useful, right? It's not so useful. It, yeah. It, it's it's too much responsibility. It's more useful. So the kinds of questions people have about the future, if they if you actually prove to them, look, there are some people who know things about the future. The kinds of questions people start out with are like, when am I going to die? When is my partner going to die? Am I going to stay in this relationship? Will I have enough money? You know, the the basic questions of survival man that the psychic's gonna need a therapist right that's yeah. that people bring that to them all what am i gonna die like i don't want to yeah. see that anymore <laughs> yeah right exactly and so a, a, so a skilled psychic is usually not very interested in answering answering those questions because it doesn't help like let's say you know the answer to when you're gonna die now what no, it's a good point right? 
I mean, so now you, do, are you going to behave differently? If it's a long way off, you're actually not going to behave differently because you already know you're going to die a long way off. So <laughs> if it's tomorrow, do you want to know now? Maybe, but that's a very rare case. Very rarely is are you both going to see a good psychic and about to die tomorrow, right? Yeah. And so it's like, it, it, so then it then comes the question, but this begs the question, why should we pursue? So I pursue applications of this ability. So I pursue training people in this ability. I pursue applying this ability to try to understand, to navigate future events, um, you know, in the world, um, in intelligence, you know, how... That I'm very interested in that. So why do that if it's not going to help? And the answer is because though it doesn't give you 100% clarity, and we always have to remember that, it can actually help you consider things that you haven't previously considered. And it can change the course of history, right? So if in 2019, the fall of 2019, some skilled psychics were asked, so what do you think is the most important event that the United States is going to be facing in 2020? Like open-ended questions like that, instead of, you know, when am I going to die, right? What's the most important event that needs to be managed? And they came back and said, well, we're seeing people walking around in masks and there's just a lot of fear and there's a lot of people okay. inside. Yeah. And they'd be, oh my gosh, you know, there might be a pandemic. We better work on how to, we better game up how we would handle that, right? And then if it doesn't happen, like, okay, now you're prepared for a pandemic, that's not so bad, right? Because <laughs> eventually it can happen. And if it does happen, then you handle it well. So using it in kind of a futurist or foresight mode, I think is a really valuable way to go. Yeah. Well, so one of the things that I'd wondered about was the language connection to this. And and so, and, and this kind of came out of this idea of when you look at I would, you could look at well-known psychics. You could also look at, at religious prophets, right? But you could say like um, Jesus or Buddha or Muhammad, they, you know, uh, uh, Jesus goes out in the desert and meditates and comes back with something, you know? And, and one of the things that I've wondered is maybe they're all having the same experience. Maybe they're all getting the same information, Maybe the problem is it falls outside of language and and what we think of as symbolism, right? And and this goes to kind of the evolutionary aspect of this. And I've wondered if maybe maybe if we approached it from an evolutionary capacity, maybe that would change things. Maybe that could move this whole field forward, right? Like, I, I mean, I, I think one of the you know we we have these common themes with this, and one of them is these abilities have been with us forever and everyone or most people have them, but they're nearly impossible to use, you know, and then people in remote viewing, when they train those, they're training these visual spatial abilities. Right. So I'm like, maybe the issue is maybe it's falling outside of language. I don't know. I, I do you think there's something to that? A hundred percent. So in multiple ways. So I think it's a really good insight. And I'm going to have to talk about it for a little bit. So okay, stop, yeah. stop me if I get off course. <laughs> um, so, so let's start. So you said a lot of really interesting things. I just want to start with, let's talk about um, how language must, how we sort of think language evolved, right? So if, if my only way of communicating with you is to, let's talk about verbal language. So this is a kind of language, body language. Like if you're walking towards a cliff yeah. and I'm and I'm your I'm and I'm in your cave clan and I don't want you to die, I might go like this, right? So that's a language, that's a body language. The problem with that is if you're not facing me and if I, if you, if I don't have your attention, you don't see me. Right? So verbal language is a huge advance already even if I could just go ugh as you walk towards that if you're not facing me or you're not paying attention to me, you hear something you might turn and be like what right and yeah. you could see you could see parents and babies do this all the time when babies are crawling towards something dangerous and the and the parent is across the room they could go hey you know or stop or wait and the and the little baby goes like this and you've distracted them just long enough that you can go over there and scoop them up right before they stick their finger in the socket or whatever stupid thing it is they're going to do and so <laughs> and so um that just an ug that is well-timed 
is is this kind of survival language that's really beautiful at a communication. It's a it's a two way communication because I say it and then there's a response, right? The response might be an action, but it's a response. And so I I think that um, let's assume I sort of come on the basis I sort of come here arrive here on the basis that before that there was kind of a telepathic uh, connection. So everyone getting this kind of non-local information. Um, but the telepathic connection is kind of unreliable for some reason, the more, and right? It's, it, yeah, and it's not, it's not focused. I mean- It's diffuse, like, yeah, it's yeah, diffuse. Yeah, it's diffuse. Yeah. It, well, and uh, yeah, this, again, from an evolutionary capacity, this, so the human mind, I mean, has been evolving. It's It came from our earliest ancestors in the ocean. So- You've got hundreds of millions of years, maybe more, of evolution, right? I mean, it has been evolving for a very, very, very long time. And language is 150 to 200,000 years old at most. And really, it evolved basically for stuff like hunting, right? Like, you know, you needed specific stuff, like pick up the spear, throw the spear, or... Wait you know, a minute, but we're talking about human language. But before we were humans and we were in the oceans, it's very likely we had language, right? yeah yeah and so so the so the so being wired for language is probably older than that in oh, terms of the point. brain right so the expectation that the, so you can you can speak about what the brain expects as it's going through development and there's definitely an expectation for language it's it's structured to expect language and and for the to for evolution to pull that off has to be really old and so my sense is that started in the oceans yeah um, yeah so so maybe maybe that's the limitation. Maybe that the problem is is that we take symbolism and we put these little boxes around ideas, right? And and these abilities fall outside of those boxes because reality is so much larger. Again, the you know the map is not the territory. I think it's like okay, so something like that. But I need a visual because this is such a this is I, you know when you train people in uh, remote viewing, oftentimes you're teaching them not to label things. Like, like, so there's a tendency like, oh, um, there's something puffy and it's sort of pink around the edges and kind of glowing. It's a cloud, right? There's a tendency to say, I think I know. Yeah. It's almost like an egoic tendency to say, yeah, I figured this out, you know? And as soon as you get into that space, you're losing the information. You're not in the space of receiving the raw data. You're more in the space of an analyst who's like, I put it together. You need analysis. We all need to analyze things. But when you're in the remote viewing mode, it's very helpful if you don't go into that mode, if you're just in the raw data place. And so that's what you're constantly training students to do and yourself when you're doing remote viewing training or you're doing remote viewing yourself. It's like, be in the raw data place. Be in the, don't know, don't know, don't know. Just be in that state. Now, that's a certain kind of language in itself, but it's not verbal. It's yeah. a, right. It's and it's not symbolic. It's um, it's like a it's like a knowing space, and so um, the the way I think of it is like okay, so I'm gonna use my arm for this metaphor. Okay, so I'm gonna cut off the top of my arm here so on the, the frame. Okay, so we normally walk around, and we're like the, this these fingers feel separate from this arm, and what this is is this is um my awareness of everyday things. And this is all the information in the universe. Mm, okay. And we think we cannot have that, right? Because look how separate we are. We can try to do this, right? Oh, I'm almost there, but we're never gonna make it. At least I'm not, I'm not flexible enough. Some people are. But in any case, based on my arm, <laughs> we're not gonna make it no matter how hard we try, right? Okay. And so we can use language to try to express what that is or try to reach what that is, but it's always gonna fail. So what? Um, proper remote viewing or psychic or whatever you want to call it, intuitive training does is it does this. So it, when you're in that state, you just recognize, of course, I'm part of, of course, I'm part of all the information in the universe. Did I think I was separate from it? You know, like there's no argument that I could be separate. So here it's not a cognitive thing, but the experience is like, oh, here it is. It's right here. So now there's no need for that language to connect outside it's like it's all inside yeah 
And so that's why there's this disconnect, I think, where it's like the desire to communicate comes from the fact that there's separation. If there's no separation, there's no need to communicate. So to get into the state where you get the information, you're not separate. So then to get into the state where you're going to communicate the information, you come back here. So it's a series of uh, like union, separate, union, separate. And, and it's all it's all a ruse because, of course, when you're like this, you're not actually separate. Yeah, no, it's it, that's incredibly interesting. And, you know, this I, I think this goes to so many different ideas. Right. Of, now, it, is there progress, I guess, in understanding how to interpret this? I mean, trying to connect it back to to our reality? Because I think that's, I mean, you, like you've talked about applications of it, but I think everybody wants to know, like, why, right? Like, is there mm -hmm. progress being made there? Oh, yeah. I mean, but progress in terms of ideas that are difficult to test. So it's like, a lot of people have ideas about this, right? This is almost what Plato said about the, the analogy of the cave, right? Yeah. Or the allegory of the cave, whatever we want to call it. This idea that we can see the shadows on the wall, and that's all we can see. We're never going to be able to turn around and see that they're actual sort of people casting the shadows. Um, this sort of suggests when you're in this state, you actually, that's what you're doing is you're turning around and seeing the people casting the shadows. And this is the state of separation in which you could only see the cave wall. Um, in terms of ideas, I think the closest, I mean, the idea, I'll just tell you the idea that I'm working with. And I think that I'm sympathetic, of course, to this idea because I'm working with it, but I didn't originate it. Um, and it's this idea that sort of this state of all the information in the universe is like an informational substrate for everything that happens. Mm. Um, like a non-physical information space. I like to call it cosmic consciousness. That's, okay. that's almost like the holographic universe principle, right? Yeah, I think it's it may be exactly the same. I don't know. I would have to think about it too much. But <laughs> I figure I don't, I don't care so much about the details because I, trying to just get like one simple idea that makes sense here. Um, right now, that's the stage of the theory, right? It's just like one simple idea that makes sense. When I notice that when people go into too much detail with the theory, and I'm guilty of this too. Um, it veers off track because we have this desire to for it to explain everything, um, and then it gets too complicated. And then the person who's creating it doesn't really grasp it, and other people don't grasp it, and there's too many things wrong with it. So, it's a very simple idea of this information space that's non-physical that sets up reality, and then of course it also sets up us, right? So we're not separate from that reality, which is this part of the recognition, yeah, yeah, right? And so that idea, lots of people are thinking about, like the simulation hypothesis is a version of that idea as well, right? So, and also people who look at quantum mechanics, thinking about these sort of quantum worlds. So if you look at the um, transactional interpretation of quantum mechanics, like Ruth Kastner and, um, and uh, John uh, Carpenter, I believe his name is. Mm, okay. No, Kramer, 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 sorry, um, have have an interpretation of, of quantum mechanics where there's sort of this other world of information where things get worked out and then it manifests in this world. Yeah. And so there's different ways to think about that. So that, so progress is being made, but very difficult to test. Well, and, and then there's always, what do we call it? The hype train too, right? Like, so I go into the psychic and she has her crystal ball. She's looking at it and I'm like, well, how can that possibly work? She would look up and say quantum and that's all she would have to say. Right. And, and that is why, you know, it's, it's hard to pin this stuff down. I mean, so it's a quantum crystal ball and all of a sudden it's acceptable once again. Right. Yeah, this, the hype train is, is real, but it also helps us open our minds. I mean, I think the hype train is useful in a certain way. It helps us open our minds to things because the, it is really true that quantum mechanical systems behave very differently. And yeah, it is really point. true that it's hard to get to wrap your brain around it. And it's really true that we can somehow perceive information that we sort of think we shouldn't be able to perceive. And it's really true that that's hard to figure out. So I think just sort of sitting with all the unknowns rather than trying to collapse onto a known 
is a good place to to work with this stuff and that's very similar to trying not to label trying i mean we 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 get into the same problem with analyzing these problems that a remote viewer does right trying not to go i know it's a cloud in our science well so i was going to ask about uap because that was something that you wanted to talk about yeah and i think this goes to, i think i also think this goes to language and communication i mean maybe they don't use language maybe they can't communicate in it right and again this this is long-term evolution but i mean if you've got some kind of intelligence that's 300 million years more advanced maybe it's machine intelligence maybe it just doesn't use words oh yeah but there's a big difference between not using language and not using words right so yeah. i have a, a, a friend right now who has had a massive stroke and she's in the hospital and we communicate with her through her eyebrow raises and the way she uses her eyes right and we can have conversations and so she's not using words uh, maybe internally she is and so uap may not be using words right they they communicate cl very clearly by just showing up doing weird things and hitting the road right that's a that's a communication it says we're here we're different from you see ya and like they don't need words and so looking at behavior as a form of communication is really important it's the first form of when we were talking about evolution it's the first form of like before we even got to UG, you know, don't walk off the cliff. It's the first form of communication. And so I think one of the things that people fail to think about with UAP is let's assume that these are very advanced civilizations. They would have a model, a theory of our minds, right? So in order to communicate effectively, you need a theory of the other person's mind. I need to know that the person towards the cliff will see this and, and know that it means like pay attention. So they would need a theory of our minds. They would need to understand the human mind well enough to give a message. Um, I think they do because they keep giving similar messages. So for example, I, I always come back to this cat point uh, meetup at the Tic Tac incident. Um, oh, okay. That, that's a message of like, we know you. We know your mind. We know you, right? We're going to show up at the secret location where um, you don't expect us to be. We're telling you we know you. Same with that um, RB forty seven incident in nineteen fifty seven, where they had they they transmitted a. We talked about this one time that the um, sort of altered um, friend or foe signal. That's a we know you, right? And then um, this, I'm, I'm fascinated by this incident of the very distinct cube in the sphere. That yeah, showed, that's what Ryan Graves described, I think, right? Which also showed up years ago, right? So they're trying, so, th so that's something you would do. Maybe this is ascribing too much intentionality, but I don't think so. I think there's a lot of intentionality if you're a very advanced civilization. That's something you would do if you were trying to say, here's something unique and different and clearly that you didn't create. It's a cube floating in a goddamn sphere. <laughs> I mean, it's like, sorry, but like, do you get that we're giving you the idea that's that modern? This is a it's thing? it's it's just artistic, right? I mean, maybe, it's you know, artistic. It's, it's, they're, they're different, yeah, they're different car models. I mean, if you're an alien, you're picking out spaceships. You're, that one, the cube in a sphere, you know, it's cool, yeah. but it's also a communication to 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 show that because obviously, let's assume that there's this advanced civilization. They can also cloak that. So to show that. And to show it multiple times over the years is a communication. So, okay, so there's that piece. And then the other piece is this report, and I don't know how true it is just because I've never tested it or anything. And I and I don't know if there's any literature testing this or how you would test this, but there's these reports of people who have abduction experiences and they say, yeah, I, they were communicating telepathically. Over and over again, there's this experience of telepathic communication. Now that could be, um, you know, super secret, I mean, I, I, I'm not saying any of this stuff is true. I'm just saying, like, let's let our imaginations run wild. It could be super secret military spy programs with, um, you know, those brain uh, head, the, the EG setups where you can feel like you're communicating telepathically, but in fact, it's analyzing your brain waves. Yeah. Right? So it could be that. Um, it could be a false memory because they, you know, had an experience where people were talking to them and then they 
didn't remember their mouths moving and then they right or it could be aliens who actually have gone back to telepathic communication because it turns out to be more accurate than than speech right i, I would suggest given that we know that um when I say aliens, I just mean anything unknown. It could be us in the future, right? Um, I, I, I think that the latter is actually really interesting, of course, partly because we already know that people can do those tasks, or at least I believe we know that people can do those tasks. And so it seems to me in our future, it seems reasonable that we would continue to develop and hone those tasks and get over this taboo about them and instead use them. Um, well, uh, yeah, you know, so there, that's, there, those are my thoughts on that. Yeah, I, there's there's an efficiency aspect to this also. And again, I have a I have a computing background, and so I think a lot of the audience may not understand this. But in so in terms of the in terms of the mind, right? Um, okay, in terms of the nervous system, you know, if you you hit your arm, I've read that the signal doesn't even go to the brain directly before the reflex happens, right? It goes part way, and then you have a reflex action that happens. And that's so you could move faster, you know, because there's a there's a delay in transmitting things. Um, but from, you know, from a computing perspective, um, if you compare the brain roughly to a computer, okay, you've got incredibly fast hardware. In in today's world, even the slowest chips are incredibly fast. And then on top of that, you've got um, like low level code, which is also incredibly fast, you know, and you start to add these layers of code on top of that. So I, I used to work with PHP and Java and when I was working with them, both of those would load as actual language and they would compile into computer code like at runtime. And I mean, you would have like a four to 10 times slowdown in the speed of your code because it's loading language and interpreting it into something that it can use and then running it and then reinterpreting it back into something else. You know, and so from a, again, this, this goes back to this language idea of, um, maybe uap or whomever maybe they're not using that because it's so incredibly inefficient right maybe it's just you know it it works for our needs it works for what we do now but um you know again i mean you you go to something that's a lot more advanced to us and maybe it's just like it chooses not to communicate in that because it doesn't meet its needs well and it's I would say that it's more accurate because it's non-symbolic. So a symbol loses is a lossy, like a symbol is a lossy technology, right? Like, so when I say um, dog, that loses all of the information about what kind of dog, what age of dog, what gender of dog, right? Whether the dog has four or three legs, doesn't have a tail. So a symbol of a dog, it loses all that. And it takes too long to say, this is the gender of the dog, da, 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 right? If I show you a picture of the dog, the dog that I'm talking about, or a video of it moving, that's actually more accurate than a symbol, okay. right? But how did, but, and so do we call that language? I think we do. If I have a way of showing you that reliably without a technology that you have to ha share with me. So if I'm a, communicating across um, a temporal divide where we don't share the same technology, I can't show you a screen because you'll just be like, that screen doesn't exist and you're a crazy mad person. Instead, I have to put it into you. I have to know the technology of your brain. I have to put the, the picture into you, right? You have to have that experience. We might call it a hallucination, right? You have to have that experience. I'm going to give you that experience. And so if I were them, that's how I would do it. I would, we would have mastered how the human brain works and I would give you the experience I needed you to have to motivate you to do the thing that I knew was necessary. I know it sounds like brain control. I'm just saying, yeah, that is brain control, right? I'm, I'm controlling your perceptions. I may not be controlling your actions, but I'm controlling yeah, your perceptions. Yeah. And that's a form of communication, but it's not language. It's not a symbolic form of communication it's an actual sort of transmission so something like this happened to me like the reason i think this is so related to um sort of a basic form of communication when you don't have other methods is that when my husband my husband was i spent a lot of time in hospitals apparently my husband had a double lung transplant about 10 years ago have i told you this story no no it was wild. So he was in a state where he had had the paralytic. He was coming out of surgery. By the way, he's fine. Like he's thriving now, um, which is amazing. Um, 
but he had had the paralytic for a long time. He was on ECMO, so his blood was being circulated through a machine for a long time. So they told me, like, look, we're not sure. We're not sure he's going to come out of the paralytic. We're not sure he's ever going to like move around again. We know he's alive, but like this might be it. So of course I was scared as hell, and um, yeah, it was terrifying. And it was the third day and he hadn't moved. And I thought, I'm going to sing him. Like I'd been sitting with him and just sort of praying and just being with him. So I had been sitting with him and I said, I'm just going to sing out loud a song that he wrote for us about our relationship. So I started to sing it. And after the first verse, um, he raised his eyebrows, which is his characteristic Oh, hi cutie wow. you know it's this hi cutie sort of move and i was like ah you know and i said you raised your eyebrows you know and then inside my heart i got this the words and this is this is how it feels is like it goes inside your heart instead of your ears um i got the words i'll do it again at the end and i was like wow that was very precise i don't know what that means so i just kept singing the song and in the last verse on the last word he did it again so it's like he was establishing this communication because we couldn't communicate in another way. But he was telling me, like, I'm in here. Um, this is what this is the way we're going to do it. That's a wonderful story. That's a, I mean, even without any of the extraordinary abilities, that's a wonderful story. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was how I knew that he was going to be okay. Well, and I sort of feel if I was in a UAP and I needed to, or if I was a UAP and I needed to communicate, I would have to do something like that because we're not able to share the same physiology, you know? Yeah, it, it, there are so many stories like that, you know, people who are, I, I, I think the word is locked in, but like mm -hmm. the one that I remember, and I, it was written by a doctor and it was the surgeon. I, I'm not sure if I've told you this one before, but um I read this online a few years ago and it was very detailed. And, and what the, what the doctor had said was um, they did an operation on a man with heart issues and he died on the table. And they, they had this period of, I think five or six, six or eight minutes, something like that, where they were just frantically working to get him back. Right. Cause he was gone, you know? And, um, and so obviously in a case like that, it takes a while for the person to, you know, recover consciousness. Right. So it's like right. they, they got them, they got them going again. They, you know, it was kind of like, okay, they, you know, thank God we made it, you know, just get them, get them into recovery kind of a thing. So over the next couple of days or something, this, this elderly man starts to regain consciousness and what the doctor had written was he he was telling the nurses this number over and over again right and he just kept saying the number and again he's he's kind of coming out of being unconscious and so he's groggy and he's not he's not really there but he keeps repeating this number and he wouldn't really say anything else and as he kind of gradually gets more clear the nurse is like okay this is something is going on here she gets the doctor the doctor comes in he, he witnesses this himself and he, he kind of stops the man. He's like, you know, here, you're back. It was, you know, you, it, it, he's, and, and so that the man kind of finally comes to, and he's like, write this number down. So the doctor does. And, and, and then the man stops repeating it. And what the, what the man told the doctor, and this is what the doctor had written was, um, he'd said, I, I know that I died on the table. And when I was gone, I was in the room looking at myself, looking at all the work you guys were doing to bring me back. And he said, and I knew no one would ever believe me. So I memorized the number on the light fixture on the ceiling. <laughs> the serial number. <laughs> yeah. And so the doctor went up and looked and that was the number. Yeah. Where was this published? You know, uh, I, do, I don't remember. I don't remember. That sounds like a Samparnia story. So there's Samparnia is a, I think he's a cardiologist or he's certainly a doctor who really has a, a lot of stories about people sort of saying I was above and I, this is what I saw. So we started hiding little objects around the room that only you could see like on a ledge that only you could see if you were above it. And he had a hard time getting people to report on those because they're reporting on more emotional events. And so anyway, <laughs> but there's a whole, yeah, there's a whole cottage industry of doctors who hear this from her and nurses who hear these things from patients and are trying to verify it because what it suggests is that 
our story that your consciousness is only in your body is is not true that 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 your consciousness can kind of float around and come back to your body seems to be more accurate yeah yeah so i i, I mean it seems like I don't know. Well, one of the things that I've wondered is it seems like some of these things are almost like what you would call 22nd century or 25th century technologies, right? Like there are things that we're just starting to kind of see the beginnings of now, you know, and it, in the case of things like this, we've known forever that there's something there and we're, it's like, we're starting to explore it. We're starting to, we're starting to kind of figure out the beginnings of maybe what this is, but it, it to me, it doesn't seem like we'll figure this out really for a long time to come. Good. I'm glad you said that. So I'm going to say the opposite. <laughs> okay. Okay. I, I think that all the UAP stuff that's happening now, part of the word phenomena in UAP means that we're actually, it's bigger than just stuff in the sky or stuff underwater. It's the phenomena that go along with that, which have a lot to do with the psychic or Jedi. I like to call them Jedi skills. Um, I think we're going to see in the next seven years, so by 2030, huge advances, like we're seeing with AI, huge advances in understanding these type of Jedi skills. Um, I think it's a 21st century thing, and an early 21st century awareness is is blooming right now. And, and especially because I have people emailing me, and I myself am noticing um, that you can get AI to do some of these tasks. So you can get AI to to contact this kind of non-local information source uh, at a rate above chance. And um, anyway, I'm writing an article about that. I'll give you the link. Um, but yeah, no, I think we're, I think we, AI, uh, UAP and psychic phenomena are going to come together in some kind of way as we begin to understand them. And, and that will produce a paradigm shift where we start to understand that a powerful part of the world or universe is not material, is non-physical. And being able to understand how that works and how that influences our physical reality is really important. Wonderful. Well, Julia, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. I should close by asking, what comes next for you? What are you working on right now, other than that? Uh, yeah, that article is burning in my mind. Um, I'm actually trying to figure out my next career step. So um, I don't know the answer to that question. I'm looking at a lot of different possibilities. Uh, I want to I want to find my next place where I can have an impact on exactly what I've just been talking about in terms of public policy and um, translating this for for people in the public and getting used to this sort of new reality. Um, that's really important. Yeah. Well, what you mentioned about AI is amazing. Also, you know, I mean, connections. I, I guess it would be a different way of looking at AI. And AI is maturing so fast as a field, right? That that's. Yeah. So yeah, on that note, let me thank you once again. Lots of love.